guys, thanks for listening to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. I also want to thank the following sponsors for their support of this podcast. Without them, it, this podcast would not be possible. I want to thank the Go Hunt Insider, uh, Lorenzo Sartini and his crew over at Go Hunt. They have created the Insider, which is an amazing tool for you guys that are researching all these different western states and looking for which units to apply for and put in for. Uh, they also have the Go Hunt maps, the Go Hunt gear shop. Uh, right now, go to GoHunt.com, click sign up for the Insider, uh, use the J. Scott promo code. You're going to get a $50 Go Hunt gear shop gift card just for signing up. Go Hunt's been with me since the beginning of 2015 at, when I started this podcast. They've been a very loyal title sponsor of this podcast. And I want to thank them for their support. Make sure to go and sign up for the Go Hunt Insider. Use the J. Scott promo code. Guys, I also want to thank Kuyu Ultralight Hunting. That's K U I U dot com. Kuyu Ultralight Hunting is a direct to consumer uh, brand that sells the best ultralight hunting equipment and gear on the market today. Uh, you can go to K U I U dot com, Kuyu dot com, and order directly there on their website. I also want to thank Phonescope.com, Cheston, the guys over at Phonescope. Go to Phonescope.com. Anything you order there, use the JSCOT23 promo code, and you're going to get a 10% discount there at Phonescope. I also want to thank Lathrop & Sons, their custom boot system and custom footbed manufacturer. Uh, these guys are the boot doctors, the boot gurus. Um, they're very, very helpful. They know a lot about boots. Uh, I have switched this season to the Lathrop & Sons Encompass boot. Uh, that's what I've worn primarily on my coos deer and mule deer hunts in Mexico. And then I use the Mountain Hunter uh, for my sheep hunts, uh, specifically desert sheep. Uh, in any of that uh, more technical terrain, uh, Lathrop & Sons has a phenomenal 3D mapping imprints and, and tracing kit. Uh, they make custom orthotics, uh, just really, really comfortable, uh, very user-friendly boots and custom insoles. Uh, go to lathropandsons.com. To find out more information, you can also check out Lathrop & Sons on Instagram. They have three custom boot options, the Mountain Hunter, the Mountain Hunter Elite, and the Mountain Hunter Encompass, as well as the High Country Synergy Footbeds Custom. Uh, they also make all of these custom footbeds in wide and super wide, as well as the boots, which is rare for a boot manufacturer. Reach out to the owners, Stephen and James at Lathrop & Sons at 618-544-544. 8782. That's lathropandsons.com. Guys, I want to thank you for supporting this podcast. Love to hear your feedback. Uh, any questions you might have, you can reach out at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. That's my email address. You can follow along on Instagram at jscottoutdoors. Always feel free to send me a direct message. Love hearing from you guys. And let's get right to these episodes. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. This is your guest host, Cliff Gray. Today I have Charles Whittem and Justin Nolan from Howl for Wildlife on to discuss the wolf situation in Colorado and in particular the draft wolf plan that CPW has put out. So this plan, once solidified and after this public comment period, will guide the CPW in introducing the first wolves. And I, from what I've read, it sounds like it's going to be 30 to 50 wolves by December of 2023. We're going to have a little bit more, what I would call a slightly more formal podcast uh, than I usually do, just because I want to cover things that all the, all the hunters understand the significance of this, this uh, plan and what it's going to look like going forward in Colorado. The first part of it, I just want to go through, you know, what are the parts of this plan that are significant and may change between now and when wolves are actually on the ground in Colorado? I had a lot of questions from people when I put it out there via Instagram, you know, what can hunters do at this point to, to, um, you know, have a, you know, have a positive impact on, on their interests as uh, hunters and sportsmen. So I'd like to get you guys thoughts on that. The latter part of the podcast, 
I want to just maybe have a fun discussion of, you know, maybe some speculation, you know, Justin, I, yeah, I, you spend a lot of time as I used to spend a ton of time in one of the areas that it sounds like these wolves are going to first be introduced in. So I just, you know, we can have a fun conversation about what that, you know, what that's going to look like. I don't think any of us really know for with any, you know, high level of certainty, but I think it'd be interesting to, uh, to have that discussion. And just so the listeners know out there, the reason that I thought it'd be great to have you guys on is I saw a, a, an Instagram reel from you, Charles, recently, and it made a great point. It was an obvious one, but it was a great point because I still battle with it personally. And that's that discussions about wolves being introduced in Colorado, whether it should happen or not, that's really, that's really not a conversation worth having anymore. They're getting introduced. So at this point, we need to really focus on, you know, making the best of it. So guys, uh, step in, kind of fill in any spots on your intro that I missed, and we'll go from there. Well, I think uh, Justin was just hired into Hal for Wildlife. He said Justin Nolan from Hopper Wildlife. Oh, I'm so sorry. Congrat- I'm, it, yeah, congratulations, I'm, I'm sorry, Justin. Dude. Oh no, I'll, I'll take him. <laughs> I'll take him. Perfect. Um, Thank you, Justin. End Justin, of story. No more discussion. And I and I should have said that, Justin. Like, t- tell tell me your your relationship with Hopper Wildlife and and yeah, just throw I, that in or whatever. I don't think I could get hired. My wife would kill me. She's already <laughs> telling me to take a step back from everything I'm doing. Sorry um, about that, so, guys. No worries. Uh, Justin Nolan, um, I'm one of the owners of Minturn Anglers. We're a full service fly shop and guide service, uh, both in the Vale Valley and on the Front Range. But um, my passion is bow hunting elk. Um, It's something that I have dedicated myself for the last 10 years. I've gone pretty crazy over it. Um, That and with all the volunteer efforts I do with the various organizations in Colorado, such as Colorado Bow Hunters Association, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, to just name a few. We've been put in the forefront of what are the issues facing sportsmen. It doesn't, you know, there's many more than wolves, but wolves have dominated a lot of our time. Um, that's kind of how Charlie and I met. Um and last year we met at the Capitol when there was a bill regarding bobcat mountain lion hunting. Um, it was awesome to see the amount of sportsmen that showed up. And that kind of got Charlie and I linked up and we've just stayed in touch. And, um, you know, I'm no expert and I'm just passionate about this. And I try to learn every day anything I can regarding this um, this initiative that's going on. And um, Charlie and I bounce things off each other and. Uh, we just hope that we can help inform the public and make sure that our voices are heard when it comes to decision making. And Charlie, do you mind just giving like a brief intro on how how for wildlife? Yep. Uh, my name is uh, Charles Whitlam, Charlie, Chuck, whatever you want to call me. Uh, different people call me different things, but I'm the president and founder of of How for Wildlife. What How for Wildlife is 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 essentially a, a a website where you can go where you see as long as we can get to them issue that's going on on one page so you the user can go there and see everything that's going on in every state you know that we have up there and you can take action on it it doesn't matter what state you live in we've made it to where you can take action to some level that can be through emails calls twitter (laughs) faxing or taking it to the next level which is really getting involved at uh, commission level discussions so being involved in commission meetings, which is not talked about a lot, um, but it's extremely powerful. And I don't think a lot of people understand that that's where most of the decisions are made. Well, a lot of decisions are made are at the commission level. So it's not even through your legislator uh, all the time. A lot of times rulemaking and all that, as I'm sure you guys know, are at the commission level. And those are open for open to the public. So uh, we do a pretty good job at organizing, uh, you know, people to get involved at, at that level. And I think now we have mm, just in three states, we're probably around 2000 people that have been at commission meetings in the last year, which is pretty impressive. Cause if you were ever at those commission meetings, there was, you know, maybe three people there <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, from the, from the hunting side. But yeah, in a nutshell, that's kind of what we do. We, we've tried to make it as easy as possible and, and take out all the 
you know, the unknowns or the roadblocks for people to get involved. Um, and our delivery system is, it's completely different than, and this is all on the back end, but it's completely different than any other action center you have seen. I've basically learned from them, but I've learned the most probably from anti-hunting organizations and have mirrored what they're successful at. So that's kind of what how for wildlife is. Um, I am a, uh, I've been a hunter all my life. I grew up in Michigan. I do live in California, which is um, so pro hunting. So that's why I live here. <laughs> uh, I, I mostly bow hunt. Uh, we share those, Justin and I share those passions. So yeah, I love everything about hunting. Justin, you've been, yeah, I mean, you say you're not an expert, but of all the, the folks that I've interacted with over the years, you were always on top of these issues. Even when I was outfitting in Colorado, honestly, when I had discussions with you, it was like, oh, he's he's active. He's going to the meetings and uh, he actually knows what's going on, um, probably more so than the vast majority of folks that I talk to. So if you don't mind, just so all the listeners can uh, can know what we're talking about here, the Colorado uh, wolf reintroduction plan. What are the, you know, what stage is it in right now and what's really up for debate discussion in the plan? Yeah. Um, well, I'll briefly touch on something we said earlier, this whole issue, if wolves are coming or not, that that's passed when proposition 114 was voted into law, um, that mandated that Colorado parks and wildlife develop a plan for reintroduction. Um, there's going to be a lot, I, I think in this discussion, we'll probably touch up on some of that verbiage. Um, where we are now is the draft man, the draft plan stage. That plan was released on December 9th. Um, there is, and I'm going to pull it up real quick. So I don't misspeak. There are eight, cha nine chapters in the plan, um, each that to tackle a different phase or issue with the reintroduction process. Um, we are now in the public commenting phase um, where CPW is gathering public comment, listening to testimony, answering questions. There's a back and forth dialogue component between Colorado Parks and Wildlife employees and the appointed commissioners. Um, where we're trying to flesh out, iron out this plan um, there's been a lot of scrutiny, there's been a lot of debate, and there's been a lot of, quite frankly, outrage. Um, you'll see more outrage from the wolf advocacy side. Um, we as sportsmen, I think we're coming to the reality that wolves are here. This is a, con I mean, hopefully we can make a compromise here and we can have a seat at the table or some say. Um, but there's a lot of kind of back and forth. Um, we have three, excuse me, four in-person meetings have just concluded. Uh, we just had the meeting in Rifle, Colorado yesterday. So these meetings are taking place around the state um, to try and give a balance um, in terms of demographic, where they're being held. They're not, not all being held in Denver. Um, right. There is only one in-person meeting left. That'll be in Denver. Um, you know, and we can jump into these later, but, you know, sportsmen have shown up. We really have dominated the comments and we have shown up in force um, in our support of the different phases. Um, however, yesterday a vote was taken, an informal vote, from my understanding, on if the commission felt comfortable moving forward with the draft plan. They did that phase or chapter, however you want to define it. Um, they did that individually there and kind of caught us by surprise yesterday. Um, so I don't know if you've got questions on that process um, or what the different phases are, but the draft management plan has been released. They're now fleshing it out. Um, the idea is that this will go to a final vote in May and then become um, the, the guidance for how CPW will um start um, Paul's on the ground, as they like to call it. And I believe they're trying to get that done by December of 23. Gotcha. What uh, in the meetings you've been in, Justin, what are like the key 
the key uh, parts of the plan that are being debated or that are, are the most contentious? Well, everything's being debated. So, yeah, I, you know, there's a lot of hot button issues and unfortunately that sometimes puts others in the background that are just as important. So if you don't mind, I'll just quickly list them off. Yeah, um, go for it. The number, the number one issue that everyone is up it's since this plan was released is you're always going to hear it's le lethal management is the number one hot button issue um if lethal management should even be in the plan um the I mean, i'll just come out and say it you know they're very well the wolf advocacy groups are very well organized and articulate and they're coordinated in how they attack this part of the plan there one could even say there's some collusion on the commissioner side of how these comments are placed um but they're trying to say that there is no science that supports lethal management of wolves, that lethal con you know, conflict resolutions that involve lethal management have no scientific data to support they even help. Um, this plan, and I'll take a step back, I forgot to mention, this plan has been developed by a stakeholder advisory group that had representatives from the agricultural community, ranchers, farmers, had sportsmen, had outfitters, as well as advocacy groups, wolf advocacy groups. Um, they all came to a consensus in their recommendations on this plan. So it, it was a compromise from all folks uh, right. involved, as well as a technical working group that brought in the best available science. So when we go to these meetings, when it comes to lethal management, you're you're hearing the buzzwords, best available science, peer-reviewed science. And what, and what they mean is they want their peers. Um, they yeah, sure. don't believe that lethal management has any grounds. So that is the number one contentious issue. And then phase four, as you mentioned, involved the potential. Um, it, it allowed CP, it gave CPW language that they may consider once wolves are recovered, um, that they could be returned to a game species. Yeah. So, so really what we're talking about in all stages of, or all phases of the plan, the contentious part is the killing of wolves, basically, right? In, in stage four, potentially hunting them, stage one, if they're a major conflict and they need to be dealt with that way. That's, I is that, is that right, Justin? That is right. And I think this, I think you've hit the nail on that. It is the contentious issue of, are the, should the wolves be lethally managed? Um, but it all shoots from there because it doesn't stop there. It's not just that. I mean, it is anything and everything in this plan is scrutinized and nothing is acceptable. Um, CPW has defined recovery goals. That is being debated as that's not a realistic or scientific goal. Um, we should have more wolves on the ground. And then when we even try to move from how many wolves are on the landscape or what recovery goals look like, we then throw in, okay, well, that even if we have the number, where are they geographically? So they always want to throw in parameters. I think this all boils down to, um, I think it all the crux of everything is lethal management, and they want all these different parameters and metrics in place to combat lethal management, to never have wolves ever removed lethally from the landscape, whether it's by a hunter or a government official. It's crazy to think about, Justin. It's and to, I guess in my mind, um, it's amazing how quickly this has become the primary issue. I'll give you a little history of my thoughts on it. When the ballot initiative came out, I actually thought it was going to pass by a huge margin just based on the politics in Colorado. I was amazed how close it ended up being, if I'm being totally transparent with my, my thought process. But during that whole process, management, you know, including at least from, I guess, you know, whatever propaganda or information that I got, management always included the potential of, you know, keeping the population at a certain level in Colorado. That seemed to be, you know, what was what was said, uh, or at least I felt that was the feeling like I, I wasn't pro wolf, but I did it seemed like to me the proposition was portrayed in a way that they would be managed, right? Um, and now, almost immediately, that's not the case. I, I mean, I don't, I mean, I can go back to just my my redneck thought process 
and being around wildlife my whole life, you can't manage them if you take killing them off the table. That's, I don't know how else to say that. I don't really care about the scientific research. It's just not, it's very, I can't imagine any world where that's not the case. So this it's kind of mind boggling mm. that we're already on this path. The problem, and I'm, and I'm sorry if I keep t- taking no, over okay. here. The, I think the problem is, is where, you know, there's reality versus, like, how do I word this? I grew up in, in a, my father's a doctor, my mom's a nurse, and they used to always talk about there's clinical, there's there, there's what you learn in class and there's what really happens in the hospital. And you can learn in your textbooks and you can learn everything in a bubble of what your theory or what your models say. But boots on the ground are, 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 are really what matters. I mean, shoot, think about us as hunters and anglers. How many times do we read that elk are supposed to do this and this? And then we go in the field and you're bonked on the head and you're like, well, that's not what the book said. Um, I, I think that transpires into real life. They they will present science to paint a rosy picture or to paint the outcome that they desire and will not listen to any reality I would encourage everyone, all of the commission meetings are available on Colorado Parks and Wildlife's YouTube channel, and you can listen to every comment. I think the most impactful and powerful thing we have is Don Gittleson. Mr. Gittleson is a rancher in North Park, Colorado, up in the, near the Walden area. He is the rancher that had the first confirmed wolf kills in Colorado. He has now lived... 12 to 18 months with wolves on the landscape. He has real life interactions. This isn't what your study says. This isn't what your paper out of CSU says. This is a real life rancher living with wolves who from my interactions and discussions with people around him and briefly meeting him at the meetings, I don't think he came into this with I hate wolves. I want wolves off. It was, I'm willing to try anything. I just want to make sure that my livelihood and my livestock is not harmed. He has now spent 18 months with all the non-lethal measures. Um, I encourage you to go watch it. He spends 30 minutes talking about his experience. It'll move you. I mean, it's just heartbreaking. Non-lethal measures work until they don't. And I think that's what, you know, to bring it back to our discussions, that's where we're having a lot of problems is like, we're not saying we're willing, unwilling to try non-lethal measures. We just want to have tools. And why is it preposterous for people to think that maybe we have this tool in our toolbox? In a perfect world, we never use it. But let's not strip the agency from management tools. On that, because to me, this seems like a very important in, important part of what this plan ends up looking like. Is there anything that people can do? I mean, maybe Charlie, you could ty- uh, chime in here. Is there anything people could do to to influence that you know that part of the plan? Well, yeah, I, <clears throat> the most important thing you can do is is if you can show up to the commission meetings and um, and make your voice heard. You know, do your research, use the talking points that we have, which essentially come from a ton of Colorado organizations that consists of outfitters and ranchers and hunters and everybody involved. They've, they've basically made their concerns. They put their concerns on paper, kind of broken down into, you know, simple talking points that people can use, but also, you know, how it's going to impact how you feel like it's going to impact, um, you know, your life if you do live there and, you know, what concerns you might have. And, you know, there's a lot, this, this whole thing's really interesting because there's a lot of stuff on paper, right? And they'll connect A and B and that equals C. But there's a lot of things missing that I think we're also, you know, missing out of the details in the in the ballot. So when people went and voted on this, like you said, you, you said yourself, you thought management was going to be a part of this plan, yeah, I mean, right? And, and- I guess for a little con- more context on that, Charlie, like I, I had friends who may have different politics than me that voted for it. And mm-hmm. I can, I would bet that if I asked them 95% of them, I said, Hey, you know, if a wolf was, you know, 
uh, killed your dog or was causing an issue in your your suburb, uh, you know, do you think that they would kill the wolf? And 90 percent of them would be like, yes. You know, I, I truly believe that. So just to give you a little color on my thoughts, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, no. So I think the overall, the way that I see it is, okay, we're going to, there's already wolves in Colorado, but we're going to bring, they're, they're going to bring more in, right? And they're calling it a reintroduction. Um, there's nothing set up for funding CPW doesn't have the staff, doesn't have the resources. So we have all this stuff on paper and we're right. going to get the wolves to a certain number, 150, I think. Okay. And then, and then after that, there's, there's may language. We may hunt them, be able to, to hunt them. Well, the resources aren't there to keep track of all of these wolves and right. you know, and if you see wolves that go, you know, across into a certain area, um, are we then going to find those wolves and move them back? How is this all possible? Where's the money yeah. going to come from? Where's the staff going to come from? So there's the reality of the situation here, right? right? And and nobody knows. Some people would disagree with this, but I'll just say nobody knows what the ultimate effect is going to be on ungulate populations. And we're talking about right. ungulate populations that have probably never dealt with wolves. So they're they're not even trained. They're not training their offspring to deal with wolves, right? So now you yeah, have yeah. this apex of apex predators, yeah. right? Because because they hunt in packs, extremely yeah. efficient. And now we're then going to say, all right, deal with wolves now. And for generations and generations and generations, none of these ungulate populations have dealt with that. So what really are going to be um, the effects of that? And I know some people would say, and they are saying, well, you can just kiss elk hunting goodbye in Colorado. I mean, oh. I don't, I don't know if that's exactly, you know, but you're going to get a lot of comments, you know, going, going both yeah, ways yeah, there, but sure. you know, like back to, back to the ballot and things that I don't know if they were considered, there's a recovery effort going on in Arizona and New Mexico of the Mexican wolf. Right. 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 And that's a recovery effort. These, gray wolves are going to I, I don't know anybody who you know really studies this who says otherwise unless when these gray wolves come down into those areas we have somebody there that knows exactly where they are and we're bringing them back so when yeah. a stray wolf comes up they're going to hybridize with the mexican wolf and it's yeah. going to flip that entire, once that happens, it's not a Mexican wolf anymore. It's going to right. flip that entire project on its head. So what's the answer for that? That hasn't really been addressed. And, you know, I have something right here just to show you. There's a, in 2014, there was a, uh, a two-year-old female wolf collared near Cody, Wyoming. That was documented on the Kaibab Plateau in Northern Arizona. So they move yeah oh yeah a lot right yeah um that's a huge huge concern yeah um you know the way i feel about before i can even be entertained if somebody wants to introduce wolves into anywhere um there needs to be management of all predators with all methods of take you know what i mean so to sure. give you an example a great example would be California. We can't run dogs. We can't we can't hunt mountain lions whatsoever. You know, we right. don't have spring seasons and people want to bring wolves in to an already existing population of ungulates and black-tailed deer, which have been, there was a five-year study on black-tailed deer that essentially said black bears are killing so many deer when they're born um that the that the blacktail population in mendocino county northern mendocino county is in dire straits now we can already black bear hunt you know boot hunt we can boot hunt yeah, them yeah. here you know so <laughs> it's just there's a lot of conversations that aren't had you know and what happens is you have the people who are just completely against hunting whatsoever they don't want to hear it and then you have 
people who don't want wolves whatsoever, no matter what, because, you know, they're frankly pretty freaked out about what it's going to do to their businesses and, and to their livestock. Sure. Or, you know what I mean? There's just a lot of unknowns going on there, and you just have these giant clashes coming together. So that's neither here or there. These wolves are, they're going to be there, yeah, you yeah. know? Um, so, and, and back to what you can do, you can also, you can submit comments. This is, you know, requested by um, the CPW to submit comments on this management plan. So you can do that. And we have that set up as well. Um, that basically goes to kind of everybody who's involved who needs to hear it. So, you know, hopefully the, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, you know, kind of a thing. But, uh, I'll tell you what, you know, if we didn't show up, uh, it'd be, I think it would be a lot worse than whatever the outcome is going to be. Right. We, we need, we need to show up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The, the, that's the thing is that a, a big part of it is that, yeah, it may not feel like there's great positive momentum but you still you, you still got to go there to get worse and worse you know and yeah. charlie you and it, you i'm sorry go ahead justin sorry i just wanted to add you know i've been having a lot of these conversations whether it's with you know friends colleagues here locally people who want to know how to get involved and um we've had a lot of these conversations what is this plan what the pro you know the the biggest struggle i have is you can spin in a million circles. How do I want to attack this thing? The plan is not perfect. There's a lot you could comment on. There's talking points that we've provided. So I would ask anyone to comment to speak to what affects you, what you're passionate about, whether it, how it impacts you as a hunter, how it impacts your livelihood as an outfitter um, or a rancher. I mean, the problem is, is we can go in so many different directions with this because we're fighting this battle on so many fronts while trying to also keep some key components yeah, um, sure. that we want to support in the plan. I mean, so I again, I just wanted to say, you know, it's like there's so many issues with this plan that um, that's kind of what our hope is to give those talking points Um it may feel like you're doing nothing. It may feel like there is no hope, but um, from what I understand, you know, these comments are going to resonate. And as sportsmen in Colorado, this won't be the last issue. Um, so we, you know, we want to be in a position where we're paying attention and we can quickly pivot to any other issue that comes about. Right. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear you on that, Justin. I, I want to, I, I want to just circle back to one thing that, that Charlie made me, made me think about and it's, Something that I view with wolves is is slightly unique versus other predators. I've I've been around them a fair amount, and I used to spend a bunch of time in British Columbia in the spring, you know, a couple months every year. And uh, so I was around them quite a bit, and they move a ton. And I think it's significant because what I noticed over the years of going there and being in wolf country, not only do they move a ton, but they move where there's more game. It's not like what I noticed is it just is just anecdotal to my experience, but it's formed some of my thoughts on them is if the hunting's better on the other side of the mountain, but there's still game on this side of the mountain, the wolves will go where the hunting's better. And so one thing that kind of strikes me about this whole, you know, no, no lethal control and kind of just, you know, I, when I read the plan, it's almost like, you know, what, you know, what's the proper population, you know, all these benchmarks are wishy-washy and then control them is wishy-washy. And the thing is, is these wolves are going to go wherever the game is. And the way I think about that in some ways is depending on where they put them off the bat, they're going to be in Utah pretty quick. And I think Utah has a different opinion about them. They're going to be down on the Apache reservation pretty quick. And I think they have a different opinion about them, you know. And so my thought process on this is, is it's, it's a little bit different with wolves because this plan and a lack of controlling them is actually throwing a bunch of crap on a bunch of other entities that aren't involved. You guys, have you guys thought about it in that context at all? And has there been any discussion of that at these meetings? Oh, let me, I have my views, but I, I think this would be important too, is to attack it from a different perspective, um, to take it from the wolf advocates perspective. I, but you know, the people that want wolves on the landscape revere them they generally love wolves. They they care sure. about these animals. They want them. So where I'm trying to separate myself is you care about these animals. 
Let's look at them on a macro aspect and not a micro aspect. You want the health of the wolf population. You want the for you want the pack health to be there. Mr. Gittleson talked about it in his testimony. You know, he's right on the Wyoming border. I think this will play into what you asked, Cliff. These wolves, because there was no lethal management and because the non-lethal cracker shells and the, the things that they deployed that had zero effect, those wolves quickly le- lost their fear for humans. Um, he talks about in his testimony driving his pickup truck at full speed, shutting it off to listen for the wolves. They were on a calf driving right up to the the um, the dominant male, the lead wolf and him not caring, taking sure. everything of him, charging them to scare him. And his testimony was, man, they have no fear of, of humans. As soon as they cross that border into Wyoming, they're they're shot. They have open hunting seasons. These wolves have no fear of humans. And and lo and behold, yeah, they, you know, they suspect that two wolves from that pack were um were hunted and, and taken. So uh, you could think about it from that issue is if we have no lethal management in Colorado, what does that do for the overall health of the the, the pack? I mean, they're gonna lose um that fear. Um yeah, well, yeah. The, I mean the other thing is they'll consume their they'll consume their way out of an area and they're going to keep moving until they get somewhere where, where they're good. It de- doesn't matter what Colorado thinks. They're going to be under a totally different level of management. You know what I mean? My personal view is they don't care. I, I think the goal gotcha. is just to get as many wolves on the landscape. I'll be able to, you know, shut up. Let's put these wolves on the ground. No say. We just want them on the ground. No management. It's the yeah, preservation yeah. mindset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's it's it's hard because that's a hard mindset to come to a compromise on. You know what I mean, uh, Justin? Like mm-hmm. I, I I've tried to find a silver lining uh, in this wolf deal for for me personally, and yeah, you know, I made my living on you know in outfitting guiding world where you know this obviously is going to you know in nine out of ten scenarios would be have a negative impact on it. I you know would be what most people would say, um, but. The time I've spent in wolf country, wolves are cool, man. Every time I've seen them, every time I've heard them howl, pretty cool. Um, so, you know, my silver lining is like, well, you know, that's that's that would be neat to hear them in Colorado. I'm not going to deny that. But the idea of it just being totally, uh, you know, without bounds is uh, is kind of stunning, man. <laughs> you know, not to not to just dwell on my personal opinion, but uh um, Wasn't it a shame that your like that our views of wolves and um, we're not allowed to accept reality? I think history has shown. I mean, a lot of people like to paint us as anti-wolf. The hunters hate wolves, and you hear it in the meeting. You hear it in the meetings. The buzzwords: trophy hunting. Oh, there's slaughter and trophy hunting. Right. I think that's the issue. I think the issue is, is as a sportsman's community and looking at the history of the Northern Rockies, we've been burned. The wolf reintroduction in the 90s in the Northern Rocky states, no management control was ever given to the states. It was jammed up in courts. It was filed in the, you know, in a California district where injunctions were placed for years. And it took 25 years almost for states to regain control. So I think our history with wolf reintroductions we have a distrust and a sour taste in our mouth. Let me just add something real quick. I think this is yeah, go ahead. kind of off subject, but you were talking about wolves and how they move and how they're hard to track. And we just had in the Denver Post, all of the media was CPW was celebrating that they, they captured and collared two wolves in the North Park region here. And everyone, three days after collaring wolf, and I don't quote me on the, I think it was 2102. Uh, he's a male wolf that had, they believe is a um was a pup that has now grown to full maturity had come back from wyoming um the money the efforts to track and collar these wolves he already slipped his collar in three yeah. days in fact in a hot mic at a cpw commission meeting uh, one of our outfitters in the north park region testified to that cpw had to respond you could see the, they're like, well, let's verify that. And then they indeed verified it, that they had three days of what they call mortality data. Doesn't mean the wolf's dead, just meant that the collar had gone, um, had not moved in three days. And 
they indeed, they had collared this wolf and within, you know, I don't know, 24, 48 hours, he slipped this, this collar and then they had three days of dormant data. Yeah. Dude, I mean, it's, it's crazy, but it kind of goes back to like, yeah, obviously it's difficult, but it goes back to Charlie's original point. All this stuff got passed without any plan of like funding it, having the crew to do it. I mean, this stuff's so involved and it. I guess it's wild to me, Justin, that, that it could be that I guess we were all so naive. Well, I shouldn't say we were all because it seemed like, you know, people who were against the ballot initiative, they knew that this was going to be a problem. But like, what what is, is there? And I didn't read the whole plan. It's it's 200 and whatever pages or whatever. But is there what is the plan for funding the, the deal? Before we touch on funding, can I, I kind of call myself naive and and I think this is a good point to bring up. Um, is there any legal standing on it? No. Um, but let's talk about the ballot. Let's talk about the the ballot. And you were what you know, you used to live here and I'm sure you voted and got the little blue voter book in the mail. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I went back and looked at it because I've had these conversations with folks. In fact, I've had these conversations with folks that voted yes for Proposition 114. We start having they're not necessarily advocate advocates for the wolf reintroduction, but they're we talk about it and they're like, I didn't know that. So I was curious and I and I looked up and I found a copy of the blue ballot book that how many of us actually read that when we go to vote. Proposition 114 in the actual ballot language made no mention that wolves were going to be defined as a non-game species. So and we can pivot to that later but that's a huge point is wolves are a non-game species and you can't have any mention of it in our plan so i went back and looked at the ballot prospectus that comes with it and there's three pages that talks about proposition 114 there is no part of that writing whether it's the fiscal note anything that talks about wolves are defined as canis lupus non-game species. In fact, if you want to find that definition, you have to go to glossary of terms on page 70 of the book, where on the last line of page 70 of the 2020 or 2019 ballot and book, book, it says in parentheses, footnote B, gray wolf is defined as canis lupus. Now, I've done papers in college. I've read publications, I would argue that it's on you to research a footnote. There was no mention of a footnote. How was I to know as, or the general public to know that there is a footnote to this definition when you go back to the Proposition 114 language and there's not even a parentheses B to indicate that I should look this up. And you're going to hear, you know, you've got the first gentleman and, you know, claiming that this was a democratic process and that the voters voted for this. And let's call a spade a spade here and use some common sense. This was designed, this was to, this was tactfully created to push this language to try and battle any mention of game species or any lethal management. Um, and, and so I just wanted to add that. I know you asked me a question about funding. I mean, it could just be like, hindsight man but it does feel and and I, and I voted ag against the ballot initiative as you can imagine but I do feel that like it swindled a bunch of people man it's like a switcheroo a little bit <laughs> you know well you talked about that vote being so narrowly passed um I you know I was my understanding that it passed by a major it, when I look at the the ballot it looks like it passed by 63,000 votes um it was 50.9% to 49.1. It's hindsight, right? But yeah, yeah. man, if we would have gotten our message out, you know, or even that the ballot was written in a way where we could put all the cards on the table, whether it's funding, whether it's what this, you know, I think if we have conversations like this where we speak, you know, let's just be transparent. Let's just call a spade a spade. Let's not paint the wolf as some magical creature that is going to fly off of a rainbow and solve every problem. You know, and that's the world that they want us to believe. We're not allowed to objectively evaluate a wolf. They're on a pedestal. 
Uh, I think we could get to a place that suits everyone if we just evaluate them for what they are, manage them the way they need to be managed, and then maybe we could all come to a conclusion that a wolf is just a wolf. They're neither bad nor good, but they need to be managed like every other species. I think it's I think it's unethical. It's irresponsible. It's um, frankly. I would say personally, it's fraudulent. Um, ballot box wildlife management or legislation is look at it this way. What if we took to the ballot on what the public thought the best practices were for brain surgery? Right? Who the heck knows about it? Right. You know what I mean? You just you make an emotional case and then, yep, yeah, this is how we're going to do brain surgery now. But then you have all the experts. You actually have the science that could address this. But CPW and everyone else involved, I think they're on gag orders. So you can't. Yeah. they can't even talk about it. The experts can't even actually, who know these things, who, who've been working on this and who can give insight or bring up is issues like, hey, uh, we don't have enough staff for this. We don't have, you know, here's what really happens, you know, or, or we don't have funding for this. They can't bring up any of those issues that, that they have, that they know about. Right. Um, they can't address the science. It's insane. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 it's demeaning, man. Imagine being one of them. Right. And it's, it's gotta be demotivating and everything else for those people who, yeah, it, I totally agree with you, Charlie. Most of our, you know, what we vote on, I think the 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 idea would be it's it's for things that are going to affect your everyday life that you have to deal with, right? Yeah. But and I'm not I'm just making a point, you know, how many people that voted on this will ever even see a wolf? Yeah. Have, where a wolf would even affect their life in any way shape or form. You know, um it's just and and when you look at you know what the governor might feel and and who his associates are and and how they might feel on this issue you start to put pieces of the puzzle together of yeah. you know yeah. what's 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 really going on here and yeah. now we have the same people who wrote this deceptive piece of legislation are now on the side fighting everybody against any type of uh you know management that would actually in the end i think would actually save wildlife yeah wolves elk deer you name it that's the crazy part is that yeah yeah you no know, it gets put on us that we're out there to just kill wildlife no i actually think through proper management we're actually saving wildlife and we have a hundred yeah, years sure. we have a hundred years of history that that can prove that you know right. so it just gets flipped Isn't that what's an flipped, issue but... uh, yeah. what's that justin isn't that what's at issue? I would argue that the very foundation of the North American model of wildlife conservation that's been adopted by pretty much 50 states across this country is the heart of the issue. You hear it in meetings all the time that CPW is run by hunters for hunters. And this, you know, there's this growing within that community, the, the, the environmental advocacy groups, there is this growing concern that we are facing an extinction crisis and that we need to change the agencies. And I, I'm i going to put my conspiracy hat on. I wonder if the goal through no management, no funding, is to blow the agency up so that it can be remade in the likes of without statutorial representation from sportsmen's groups. Um I know I just kind of went on a you know extremist view there, but uh, it begs the question when you ask questions to Colorado Parks and Wildlife, where's the funding coming from? How much is this going to cost? And you get these roundabout answers of, oh, we have overflow from this fund or we have, um, you know, by statute, and I'll touch on this real quick. We There was an act passed um, in a sportsman lobbied for this um, that does – on paper, shield licensed sales from hunting and fishing dollars from being used for any wolf reintroduction efforts. 
$1.1 million has been appropriated by statute um, or by, by an act of, through the legislation to take from our general fund, that's taxpayers' money now, um, to fund the wolf reintroduction, but that needs to be approved and re-upped every year. So our funding is based on the pulse of a legis uh, state legislation that's going to approve this. So where is this funding going to come from? If we don't have funding, the agency is going to lose their enterprise status and they, they, they could be blown up. And that's a reality. I would imagine medical boards and um, our, the people who sit on those boards are doctors and surgeons. Um, yeah. And if you look at it that way and you look at what it is they're trying to do, they're trying to put, um, you know, they're trying to place people who have, who aren't doctors or surgeons um, onto a medical board. Yeah. You know, it's a good and analogy. That, right. And, and that's really what's, I think, happening here. Um, and maybe we haven't done the best job sometimes as, as hunters or whatever to get our message across or whatever. That's a different conversation, but I, I like to look at it that way. And I think that's how, that's how important this is. If we want to continue to see uh, healthy populations of wildlife on the landscape in North America. Right. Because again, yeah. this is, this isn't just Colorado. It is all those bordering States. Yeah. Right? yeah. And then those States are going to have to have a management plan because wolves are coming. So oh, this yeah. not, you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah sure. This, this Colorado issue is Utah's issue and Arizona's issue and New Mexico's issue and Wyoming. You know what I mean? It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's everybody's oh, yeah. issue. You asked, you asked a question about do who has the voice for our ungulates. Yeah. Well, this that's is, a good, that's this a good is, way to put my question that took me. Who has a voice for our, out. yeah. I, I think that the debate, I think the writing on the wall is clear of where do you stand? And while we as hunters, Maybe we have some work to do on the North American model of what we, how we fund conservation or how we fund habitat. And we could probably all look at that internally and, and, and do better. We are the voice for ungulates. Um, there was, we've talked about this plan and about why maybe we need to get this passed by CPW because of a changing commission in the spring. There was a plan put forth by wildlife, wild earth guardians it was their version. Um, they wrote their own response to CPW's draft management plan and what they thought is a better draft management plan. And I think us as hunters supporting Colorado Parks and Wildlife is the voice for ungulates in that, hey, their plan calls for zero predator management and the number of wolves on the landscape should be, should be determined by how many elk we can can feed the wolves there's no consideration for hunter opportunity or what the the management objective of our elk herds are we uh, you know i we'll get into elk herds here in a second but let's just you know three hundred thousand is the kind of the number thrown around of how many elk are in the state of colorado if wild earth guardians got their way they would divide that number by 15, 15 elk per wolf. That's how many wolves should be on the landscape. You look at their plan, they want 2,500 wolves on the landscape because that's how many ungulates could feed them. That's just preposterous. And think yeah. about what that and think about what that would do. What would CPW, where would they get their funding? Who, where, yeah, you know, sure. where would where would license sales go? Where would any of this come from if that if that exists if there was 2500 wolves on the landscape how much hunting is there going to be in well, 20 years Charlie, you me on the head we i like to bring this up because i have my personal views and i try to separate them i mean i can get pretty selfish in some of my views i want to hunt the best tags in the country every year that's just not a reality i yeah, mean sure. I want, to, I want to go to unit two in Colorado and hunt an elk every year. Unfortunately, that the demand, you know, that that's not that's not going to happen. And we have sportsman's issues right now. Um, I won't give my views on it because my intent is not to divide sportsmen, whether you're a non-resident or a resident. CPW, you've heard in the news, you've heard in the forums that, oh, tag allocations on the West are changing resident we're pitting resident versus non-resident well 
this whole model we're talking about, the North American model, that is revenue is generated through license sales, through hunting and, and, and fishing licenses. And we're over here as sportsmen fighting with each other saying, oh, they're going to reduce my tags and they're going to do this. I'll argue that the bigger threat is unchecked levels of wolves. I mean, I always joke and I like to say like just little quick comments and just to kind of lighten the situation. But I used to be in sales. And uh, one of the things that a mentor of mine said when he said, you know, do you want me to come in and help you with this sale? A little bit of something's better than all or nothing. And that hit home with me. A little bit of something is better than all of nothing. So if we're sitting here arguing about allocations, what happens to our quotas, our hunting and fishing tag quotas when wolves come in unmanaged and knock our elk herds down to a point where I don't have the numbers on how many elk tags were sold. But for argument's sake, let's just say, you know, let's just use 10,000 as a number because I can do the math. If we had, if I'm as a resident, if I'm getting 65% of 10,000 tags, that's a lot better than 90% of a hundred tags. And I'm just using that for illustration purposes, but sure. I think this whole model of revenue and everything comes, it all boils down to our the health of our ungulate herds and how many elk are on the landscape to support hunting and fishing. Right. Excuse me. Honey. Yeah. I, Division um, amongst hunters, I think some people are possibly falling into uh, the trap that I think anti-hunting organizations are setting. Um, so there are definitely moves and in, initial. I mean, you can go right to their websites and see what they want to do. They want to change sure. how commissions work. They want to change um, how appointments to commissions work. They want to change, they want to essentially get rid of the North American model. Now, let's say there's all these wolves. How are, are people just going to pay now to come to Colorado to see wolves at the level that they do currently non-resident and resident to hunt elk right. and all the money that that generates and the economy that's there because of that, um, that, 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 that provides, um, I don't think so. You know, and I don't think wolves are just going to be hanging out like it, like elk do at, at, uh, you know, oh, yeah. uh, right. You know what I mean? No, no, no. I mean, I've been, I've right. been in areas that are known thick for wolves and it's still hard to see. I mean, you got to be working to yeah. see one, you know, I mean, yeah. it's a totally different deal. And then yeah, obviously the economics of the two are not even, are not even close, right? The, the, you know, there's, you know, there's no denying that there's just a, there's a ton of economic value to the state of Colorado in their ungulate population. There always, there always has been. Um, I think, um, I think it comes down to, you know, who are, I think what, what people struggle with is are humans a part of nature or not? Right. You hear this all the time where we are infringing on their territory or, or sort of a mindset like that. And it's like, well, we're here on earth and we were never, we didn't come from somewhere else. We didn't come from a yeah. different planet. You know what I mean? We're not an alien species here. And whether you believe in, in creation or evolution, I think that supports that, you know, um, if you do, you know, b believe in evolution or something, then of course you believe we came from, you know, we were a monkey or a fish or whatever. So we're, of course we're a part of this. Right. Um, it's a, it's a strange, um, I think it's just, our society today, there's people who frankly um, kind of think it's ridiculous to go outside. And, and I, I say these things because I see these, I see these comments um, like at, at night, go outside at night. There was a kid just a few miles up the road the other day who um, was with his parents and his grandpa, I think possibly. And they were on their property and they were, you know, it was getting dark outside. And uh, the kid was like, I don't know, 20 feet ahead of them on a trail and a mountain lion came out and attacked the kid and, you know, had its fangs and claws in the kid. And the mom came up and hit the lion. The lion took off. And the comment. So so the issue was. Fish and wildlife wanted to find the lion, you know, um, and 
I think they were going to remove it. I'm not, I'm not sure what they were yeah, going to do, do something about it. Re relocate it or whatever, but mm -hmm. it was on a neighbor's property, they think, and the neighbor wouldn't let them on. But the comments are just sort of, well, this is what happens when humans move into their area. And I'm like, all right, these people have been living here. This is, you know, half moon Bay or whatever in California. There's been people here for, for quite a while. Yeah. Um, and, and other comments are, well, what are you doing out at night? Why are you out at night on a trail? And it's like, kind of a mindset it's like <laughs> yeah. what are we I supposed to do you. we just sit inside like uh oh darkness you know the vampires are coming out we better get inside i mean yeah yeah sure listen and it's and it's not and i think maybe one of the issues is is and i have a problem with it when people say kill all the wolves kill all the lions you know kill all the bear yeah. whatever you know um that's wrong <laughs> that's ridiculous yeah no i i agree so maybe Maybe it's a reaction to that, but you know, it's, it's, it becomes a philosophical debate really. Yeah. 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 When there, and there's, I, I'm totally with you. We could have like a whole nother podcast about that. Cause kind of related to that, Charlie is I feel like this wolf thing, like if we take it and we ab abstract it, you know, part of it is that really what's happened is people who want wolves on the landscape, they like that idea they've they've been inconsiderate to the fact that everybody that has to deal with the negative side of wolves um they they aren't they aren't those people so all the negative aspects of this vote and you know that comes out of this whole management plan people who didn't vote for it are the ones that are going to have to deal with it i don't think any even of the wolf ad advocates could say that there's 100% it's all 100% positive for everybody that wolves are on the land landscape. Obviously, there's going to be some things that are a pain in the ass about having wolves out there. Uh, the, but you, that other people have to deal with that, not the people that voted for it. Sorry to cut you off. Um, I think that's the therein lies the problem. The view is that I'm formulating my opinion here based on comments I've heard through every commission meeting. And we're, we're trying to tackle issues like fair livestock compensation. We're trying to feel, you know, sure. what is that number? How do we determine what, how do we determine well, there's debate on even how do you determine if a uh, livestock predation was even a wolf? And I believe we talked about kind of, let's just lay it all out on the table and, and call a spade a spade and let's have honest discussions about wolves. I think there's this fear of the reality being portrayed because the wolf advocacy side wants us to believe everything's rosy. You hear it in comments. They believe that, it's not the wolf's fault that they were preying on livestock. It's the, I, I can't stand this the idea that cattle ranchers across the West are evil and it's their fault for bringing livestock on the landscape. They des they almost deserve it. Um, it it's, hey, man, we're on the landscape. We're reintroducing an apex predator and we now need to learn to balance this. We need to introduce this so it's successful for us on the landscape um you know two of the drop sites are in the gunnison we're looking at the gunnison valley and um we're also looking at um the vale valley kind of between aspen and and vale and there's a lot of concerns on how this is going to interplay with everyone on the landscape and i think therein lies the problem what is the role of wolves on a and quite frankly, we have a landscape that's different than Yellowstone. We're different than Wyoming. We're different. I mean, how our winter migration corridors have been fragmented. Our, you know, we've got I-70 running across the state. We have, we don't have a giant national park in the middle of our state. Right. You want to talk about funding. You want to talk about winter habitat. You want to talk about the perfect balanced ecosystem. There's no ecosystem in Colorado where humans are not a part of it. We don't have these vast national parks. So if you tell me, oh, well, look at the fees that Yellowstone created from wolf watchers. What entry fees are you paying? Unless you go up to Rocky Mountain National Park, last I looked, it was pretty, it was pretty easy to go into the San Juan National Forest. You just drive up. So revenue right there. Right. What revenue is being generated? And then how are these animals wolves and cattle and wolves and ungulates supposed to interplay on the landscape when you have fragmented habitats 
what do you think is going to happen when they when they get uh, when they get transplanted? Like, what's your what's your best guess? And you know, just it, I, it, so, no one, nobody's going to be right on it. I'm just kind of curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, no, I love speculating. Um, I think right now the plan calls for ten to fifteen wolves released in 2023, with another. 15 don't quote me on this i'm trying to go off memory another 15 wolves in 2024 and i think the goal is 30 wolves in the first two years um i think you're right i think they're gonna disperse um i believe the number was wolves double every two years um if i'm correct in that i'll have to look that up um I think, you know, let's just take 30 wolves on the landscape. I, I think it's conceivable that our pack numbers are going to be in that. It's, I don't think it's hard to think that within five years, we're going to hit 150 wolves on the landscape, which would be, if it stays in the plan, would be the objective recovery goal for CPW. Um, 150, 250 wolves is the range that's thrown out there. Once we have those numbers, those wolves are going to disperse. There is a tactic right now to only release them. Well, in fact, they can't release them on federal lands. They can only release wolves on uh, private and state-owned lands because they do not have a, a 10J. Um, we can touch right. on that. But these wolves are going to disperse. They're going to be on the landscape. They don't know if it's federal or state land. They don't know boundaries. I. Uh, very quickly, those wolves are going to follow their prey base. And residents and folks on the western slope are going to be impacted. And it's going to be our it's going to be their daily life living and dealing with wolves on the landscape. My hope is through comment and and influence that our voices are heard and that a sound management plan. It is voted on in May that gives CPW the tools because within five years, we are going to see a very different landscape. My hope is that our ungulate herds do not crash like they did in the Northern Rockies in those first years of wolves being introduced. Right. Uh, it's interesting, man. I've, I've thought about it a lot and I've actually thought, and you may have more information on it, like where they're actually thinking between, between Aspen and Vale of putting putting the wolves um man i i agree i mean if i was going to speculate man i think relative to the other states people who are um pushing this or you know the advocates of it they don't they i don't know that they've spent a whole lot of time in wolf country and realized how much different it is than like the veil vale valley uh i mean the areas where i've been where there's wolves are way way more wild than than that valley you know, even, you know, the flat tops being one of the biggest wilderness areas there where I've spent, you know, a decade of my life uh, riding around. Um, those places relative to where I've seen uh, wolves thriving and and all that are much different, man. And my thought process is that I just don't see how if they put wolves uh, on, you know, in an area where they are on an ungulate population that goes down into the Vail Valley in the winter, that there's not going to be a meat, like just just a, a a very i mean even if there's 20 wolves in there 10 wolves in there there's going to be like immediate immediate in, you know conflict with with people and livestock and pets and everything else you know those places have a lot of people that live on the winter range and it's it's a lot different than these really really wild places where where wolves thrive so um so i'm with you on that man i think it's going to be a different dynamic there personally man i i don't people always ask me like, what do you think it'll do to your old hunting area to the elk? And I don't know, man. Like I really, I really don't know. You know, I'm, I'm familiar, you know, just through the business, knowing some outfitters that, that were affected by, you know, uh, wolf populations entering their areas in Idaho and they were all negatively affected, but they also had what I would consider much higher uh, elk density than, than I had in the flat tops. So I, I wonder if these wolves are not going to move, a whole lot faster and a whole lot further than everybody thinks. Um, like hundreds of miles, Justin. Like I think, I think 
they will go places where there are dense game populations and they'll start to do it fairly quickly. Well, I think so. You know, you asked where it's going to happen. I mean, you can almost speculate you want to be where the wolves are dropped off because they're going to quickly disperse. Once they're harassed, once they, you know, if they're, they're going to move to more remote areas. So I think you're, you're spot on. Um, they are going to disperse quickly. Um, it's some of the things I look at, some numbers that were put together for us that, you know, as these wolves disperse and what does our reality look like really quickly, um, seven out of 10 outfitters in the Northern Rockies went out of business within two years of wolves being reduced, uh, being introduced. In 2006, Idaho Fish and Game published a study on their website and you can go and look at it. The title of it is 11 Years Living with Wolves. What are the realities of living with wolves? Elk were the preferred diet or prey base of, of wolves. Something like 60% of their, uh, excuse me, I'm looking at it right here. 58% um, of, of what they consumed was elk. Of that, 67% of the elk they consumed were calves from Idaho Fish and Game. And we're now having conversations in our game agencies about why calf retention ratios are underprescribed. So yeah, you drop wolves in Gunnison, they're going to be in this they're going to be in the southwest corner of Colorado where I spend my time hunting, where we have problems with calf retention, why we went to a full draw and we don't have either sex elk tags. Those wolves will be in that country before you know it. And if they, and if what Idaho says is true and I have every reason to believe they're going to be whacking the calves. I guess that's uh yeah, we'll see, man. What how it, how it ends up. I mean, I, I hope the I hope for the best on this on the management part of this, man. Do you guys have anything else to add, Charlie? You got anything? Yeah, I mean, it's just <clears throat> it's just so unfortunate. Yeah, hunters make up a very small percentage of the population, um, but pay a very large portion into wildlife management. I think in Washington, I've been dealing so much in Washington state hunters make up like 3% of the population, but they, they cover, I think 20% of, uh, WDFW's, uh, budget. So 3% is, is, is paying 20% of their budget just on yeah. tag sales. Right. And the argument on, uh, from anti hunters and there is that why are we, why are we considering you know, why do we give them so much, uh, so much room and why do we have these conversations? They're only 3% of the population and, and, uh, you know, most residents don't agree with hunting and that that's their own bias polls, of course. Um, it's just take this and apply it to anything else. Like, like what I was kind of talking about with medical boards, when is it okay to not even because this is what they're trying to do, to not even consider the concerns of, what you say it was, Justin? Seven out of 10 outfitters lost their business, right? Seven out of 10 outfitters in the Northern Rockies went out of business. Um, the plan doesn't even address any compensation for outfitters. Okay, um, so, so think about that. Let's pass this ballot, right? That happened. And let's consider a management plan. And there's those out there that are saying, yeah, we can have a 70% loss of an economy. That's fine. Like, uh, what? When does that yeah. happen? When does that happen in any other facet of, of humanity? And when it does happen, you're on the, the wrong side of history. Sure. You know, it's, it's a strange mentality. And I, I don't think we really go after that as much as we should. We sort of just get focused on on hunting and hunting issues and that becomes the argument but let's kind of just blow it up and have a ten thousand foot view here this isn't it's just not right it doesn't make any sense yeah what dude, you're I, taking I, away from people i think you nailed it there charlie the, the whole discussion man and it, and it it it's hard because it doesn't it doesn't create positive momentum but it is it's like it just doesn't feel right you know what i mean the whole thing just doesn't feel right it just feels like um yeah, just kind of leaves like a bad a bad feeling in your 
in your your stomach about it. And I guess I guess the one takeaway, I guess the the thing that everybody should consider is all the stuff that comes down the pipe in the in the future, like you know, anything hunting related, anything firearm related, you you can't you can't discount that that you know the people that are calling it a slippery slope or they're calling it could be way worse. You know, this is just a you know a just a foothold or whatever, all those, you have to consider that that is the case, man. Like, um, or, or, you know, stuff gets taken away pretty quickly. Well, well, that's why, I mean, certainly why everybody needs to get involved, you know, at yeah, whatever, yeah. you know, um, whatever level is, is out there, whether it's in emails or, or going to commission meetings or just learning more. This is such a complex. Yeah subject and the management plan and all the you know what's a 10j and what's this and all the, it's like ah it's it's insane yeah oh yeah but, yeah, yeah you know just start by telling your story you know and 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 lethal management that sounds maybe that puts people off or something but you know explain what it means i'm not you know please don't say kill all the wolves that's just not going to work yeah yeah you know, well, no, no um, management is not a management plan. Yeah, right. So, you know, yeah. don't want to say lethal. Let's have a real management plan. Mm. Um, if I could parlay off of what Charlie said, something stuck with me this week. I've seen around, I've seen on the internet, I've seen people saying, well, what, what is this organization doing about this? And what is this organization doing about this? And I would encourage everyone you are the organization. You are the members of those organizations. We need members to show up and comment. The organizations can take a stance and they can pr and they can produce a uh, a statement on an issue. But the strength is in numbers. If we show up to commission meetings, if we if we comment and we engage, we can sh we can influence this decision by saying, "Wow, this base is organized. This base is vocal." And there are, wow, look at how many people we didn't consider. Um, since as of today, I'm kind of, I guess I'm a de facto employee of Hal. Um, <laughs> I might be stealing Charlie's Thunder here, which I've done a couple times in these. Um, we've talked a lot about this wolf issue. We've talked about, um, we've put together a lot of talking points. I hope we've inspired some folks, whether you're in the Denver area um, or afar, to get engaged. Um, we have one commission meeting left. It's on February 22nd. I'm not sure when this will launch, but we are hosting. Charlie has, has helped put together a sportsman's meetup here in Denver. It'll be on the 21st of February at Highland Tavern. Um, we're encouraging everyone to, if you want to comment, you want to learn more, to come to this meeting the night before. Um, I'll be there. I believe Charlie will be there as well. And we'll have some representatives from different organizations to help. If you don't know what you want to say or you don't know how you want to testify, we'll be there to answer questions and help inform and, and kind of put these into talking points. And our goal is to be in force on the 22nd. There will be a lot of media there. And I think uh, we can turn some heads with a sportsman's turnout at this last commission meeting. The commission meeting is, to, is February 22nd. And the, our little meetup is going to be the night of February 21st. Um, and I'll let Charlie speak to kind of the action center and, and what how for wildlife is doing with that. Go for it. Yeah. So, yeah. So to, you can uh, RSVP for that meetup you can text the word wolf, wolf only, only wolf <laughs> uh, to a number. It's 415 nine six five two two six five or you can go to our website find the calendar uh and you can rsvp there through the link um and then you can also rsvp for the the meeting on the 22nd now all that all that really does is just get you you know the directions and if there's any updates like if there's a change in address which might be possible um it also gets you talking points um and uh, we can just get a grasp on how many people are going to be there. Um, so those two things are those two things are on the website. And um, yeah, Justin, it's funny. I was going to say, and this is why you were hired at the beginning of the podcast. <laughs> um, you are the organization. That's uh, 
exactly what Howl is. We're not, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with any other organization or how they do it. It's just the way we have done it is I never go anywhere and say, Hey, I'm, uh, you know, such and such for Hall for Wildlife. And I represent this many members. Right. Our, our whole plan is general. Hey, general public, here's how to get involved. And you show up, you are, you are the numbers, you are the power, you are the pack. You know, Hall for Wildlife is about actually us being the pack. Yeah. And I sure. thought showing, I thought showing pictures of wolves would be kind of funny and make people think, yeah, of them, yeah, yeah. which it certainly I like has. It, man. Yeah. But, um, that's why it's kind of cool to be involved in this uh, this wolf management, uh, uh, this whole project here, right? But but yeah, no, you said it, <laughs> you said it right, Justin. You are the organization that's perfect. So yeah, it's all on the website. You can text it to that number, or you can or you can go to the links on the calendar. Awesome, guys. Well, hey, thanks for your guys' time. It was a great conversation. Thanks, guys. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. If you want to keep in touch with me, get on my website at PursuitWithCliff.com and sign up for the newsletter. Check out my YouTube channel. It's just under my name, Cliff Gray. And you can follow me on Instagram at CliffGRY. Thanks for listening.